Good afternoon. I'm Kristen Spindler, Director of Incubator CTX and a faculty member here at Concordia University, Texas. We're striving to keep our community connected to one another during these difficult times and to help you all develop important skills. I'd like to welcome all of you who are here today in person and all of you tuning in on Zoom to our webinar today with Kim and Mike Barnes. We're grateful to partner with Kim and Mike to bring you this presentation on effective communication, which is more important than ever in today's virtual world. The format for today's presentation will be about 45 minutes with Kim and Mike as they take us through their presentation. We'll leave at least 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. Uh, for those of you who are here in the room, we have microphones um, here and here. So if you have a question, we'll ask that you come up and speak into one of those microphones. If you're tuning in virtually, um, Hannah Watson um, over here and I will be monitoring the chat. So please type your questions in the chat and we will get to those as well. Um, it's been a privilege for me to get to know Kim and Mike over the last two years. Um, however, their association with Concordia goes back much further. So to introduce Kim and Mike, I'd like to bring up Dr. Abigail Feaster. Abigail is the director of the College of Business and Communication. She's also program chair communication and an associate professor communication. So thanks, Abigail. Well, if ever there was a time when we could all beef up our on-camera presence, I'd say now is the, is the era with all of our Zooms and our Teams and our Collaborates and our Google Hangouts, FaceTime, and even old school Skype. This is, might be the single most timely presentation you will have this entire semester. Um, I'm going to introduce for you two highly qualified folks who have spent their entire careers in front of the camera, and now they use their expertise to teach folks like us how to look better, how to sound better, and how to say the right things at the right time. We have Mrs. Kim Barnes, and she spent 15 years as a reporter and an anchor for local news, uh, most recently working here in Austin, Texas with KVU. She was fortunate to cover many stories and was right there at the scene of the action, including the um, Branch Davidian standoff in Waco, including the bombings in Atlanta with the Olympics. So she really knows what it's like to be in the heat of an action, stay composed, and present oneself in front of a camera. Uh, in addition to teaching broadcast journalism classes at University of Texas, which is her alma mater, um, Kim works presently now with tech companies and nonprofits, medical professionals, authors, and other such folks to train them for public speaking and how to properly do an interview, whether it's in front of a television screen or in print. In addition to uh, having Kim Barnes here, we have the good fortune of having her lesser half, Mike Barnes. And Mark, he's doing his best to keep up with his very accomplished wife, so keep up the race. Uh, you may recognize Mike Barnes when he comes on. You may recognize his face. You may re recognize his voice. You may just remember his lively commentary because Mike Barnes has been in front of the camera for uh, nearly 30 years serving as the sportscaster for KVU. I wanted to get these data points correct because this is a pretty uh, impressive career. He covered four Super Bowls, three NCAA national championships, five Final Fours, nine College World Series, and 12 bowl games during his career. That's quite an accomplishment of a variety of sports. During all of this tenure of 30 years of broadcasting, he won the Best in Austin Broadcaster no less than 17 times as well as garnered best sportscaster in the state of Texas and with the Associated Press. Presently, when Mike is not emceeing or being a keynote speaker for events like this, he works with TED Talks uh, speakers as a consultant for, again, how to help them present themselves best on camera. Um, he wants to help people connect with their viewers when it's a video in between you and also just stand out from the crowd. Uh, on a more personal Concordia note, Mike and Kim Barnes have been wonderful advocates of Concordia and have served in my program in the communication department as one of our advisory board members for over a dozen years now, and their influence and their mentoring has been very appreciated. So it's clear we've got a power couple in the house. I welcome your applause as we bring up Mike and Kim Barnes. Thank you. Thank you. We're so glad to be with you. We actually were a part of the I think very first meeting for the communications council when it was still at the old location 
Long time ago. Long, long time ago. Our kids were like playing and now they're out of college. We're dating in ourselves college, now. So yeah, a long time ago. Yeah. But we are so glad to be with you today. As, as Abigail mentioned, we have been on television for a really long time. Not that we were very good at it at the beginning, <laughs> but we've been doing this for a really, really long time. We've spoken in front of people, like a big group like this, in front of thousands of people on TV, in front of thousands of people, in front of 80,000 people at a UT football game for me. I've done it several times. We've talked in front of people a lot over the last 30 years, but it's hard to believe that when you watch us that one of us is an extreme introvert and one of us is an extreme extrovert. Would can, anybody like to guess? Can you guess who is who? Who which would you is guess? Which? And since we can't see all of you who are watching uh, on Zoom, if we get any answers, we can have uh, Hannah uh, can share with us. But anybody here want to shout You can put it in the yes. chat if you want, yes. if you want to guess. You think he's the introvert? Hmm, why do you think that? What, what do you say? Other way, Other way around. around, introvert, okay. extrovert? Interesting, okay. Can you guess? Actually, exactly opposite of that. Yes. Which is interesting. He is extremely Extreme introvert, extremely shy. Having to stay home since March has been like his dream come true. <laughs> the pandemic has been great. Well, in some me, ways, yes, right, in some for, ways. For not having to go out in public. And all of you students out there, I have, I've gone through classes in junior high, high school, and college without saying a word for the entire semester. It can happen. I'm not saying to do that. <laughs> Professors won't like that. That's right. But that's what life is for an introvert. But whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, you can still communicate and connect on camera. I learned a long time ago two things, because I wanted to be a sportscaster on TV. I learned two things. Number one, the camera does not bite. It does not bite. So you can communicate through that camera lens and connect with someone on the other side, whether it says a TV sportscaster or through a Zoom meeting if you're just talking to a professor. It can be done. And the, way, the easiest way to do it, what I did for 30 years, is picture someone on the other side of that lens. Picture your best friend, a family member, your spouse, the perfect client, a professor, a student, whatever it is that you need to communicate with, picture that person on the other side of that lens, look at that lens and communicate with that person like that's who that is. So when, because when you look at a picture of an introvert or an extrovert, can you change the slide? I'm sorry. That's right. It's not changing. There we go. When you see the picture of the introvert or the extrovert, oftentimes that's what we kind of imagine. And especially in, 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 if we're used to, if, we're, if we are somebody who is an extrovert, and I would consider myself absolutely one. Absol I love people. Absolutely, I guarantee I you. love the energy. It hasn't been as bad staying at home as much as I thought it would be, <laughs> but, but, I, but I love. So when I'm in a big group of people, I draw energy. If I'm presenting, if I am uh, in front of, uh, of a group, and I'm so glad that we have people here today so that we can feel like we actually are talking to people. I draw energy, Extra, that's what extroverts do. We draw energy from the other people. And yet, the reality of the way we're presenting most of the time today is more like this. It's us and our computer. Would you agree? And it feels a whole lot different. So it, it's different as an extrovert to be sort of boxed in, if you will, in our little box in Zoom or whatever virtual platform we're using. But there are still ways for us to be able to learn to be able to still engage and be, to be able to still have that great communication even when we can't necessarily for sure see that other person. Now we might see them on the screen and for some of us that still, that, that, that still helps me for sure. For an introvert, may not make a difference. For an introvert, you, again, you just have to picture that one person because you're great dealing with just one person. It's when you see all these people that if you're an introvert, you're like, mm, I don't know about this. But I told people a long time ago that starting in 1998, I did three years where I did uh, stuff on the Jumbotron at UT talking in front of 80,000 people. Once you get a shy guy talking in front of 80,000 people, talking in front of a group of 100 or 1,000 people, not a problem at all. No problem. Because it feels different because you see those eyeballs. And so for a lot of people, it can be a little bit nerve wracking, even as an extrovert. I still get a little bit nervous sometimes because... The difference between being in person is that I can see, I can look. Do you look bored? Is somebody, you know, is somebody on their phone? You know, I can look around and, and try to gauge that where when you are on camera, you don't always see that. So you can just kind of imagine how that they're acting. So when you think about presenting, and again, whether it's presenting since we're in the virtual world as 
uh, you know, as a presenter, if you will, in a Zoom or a virtual platform, or even just participating in class and engaging with your, your teachers and your professor, your, uh, your colleagues and your, and your student, co -stu co uh, the other students in the class, or in business. How do you feel about it? Like, what comes up for you? Do you think, oh my gosh, I can't wait. I wish I didn't have to do this. It makes me nervous. It makes me excited. Beyond just the Zoom fatigue or the, the, <laughs> the exhaustion that sometimes comes from it, just anybody shout it out. How do y'all feel about that? How do you feel about presenting? Again, having to show up on camera as part of, what do you think? You like yeah. it? See, yeah, Kim's the person on the bottom. She's jumping for joy. I'm the guy over there <laughs> wiping my flop sweat off my forehead. Anybody else? Awesome, awesome. Because I, I think the one thing that we know for sure is that the world will change from here on out. Would you agree? To some degree. I think that while we are still so looking forward to the day where we can be next to each other and not have to only have you know, 30 people in a room that should hold 200, while we can't wait for that day, even after that, I think there's gonna be a great opportunity and continue to be a great use for virtual communication because we can reach people that we could never reach before. We can, I'm in charge of an event coming up in a couple weeks and we are, our keynote is for in Chicago. How great, we, don't have, we couldn't afford to bring her in, but we can have her from her living room in Chicago. So I think there's gonna be a lot of opportunities. So that's why I think it's so important that while I think a lot of people at the beginning thought, oh, I'm just gonna kind of write it out and it'll be back to normal pretty quickly. And of course that was back in March and here we are it's September, isn't it? <laughs> I have to think sometimes. So we just want to help make sure that you feel prepared because this is today's reality. Because back in March, I think we all had a lot of grace for everyone on Zoom. It's like, oh my gosh, we're actually on. I can actually hear what Kristen says. I can actually see, see Hannah. This is great. I don't care what it looks like. This is great. Unfortunately, because of that, we've seen a lot of people look like this. Admit it, you see those guys still to this day on every Zoom meeting you're on. Have you been one of those guys? <laughs> well, hopefully after today, you will be. And again, sometimes you choose to make an exception or you may know the rules, if you will, and you may choose to break them and that's okay. But we hopefully, you're gonna, we're gonna help it so that you, you unfortunately will not ever be able to watch a meeting in the same way because you're gonna be looking for those things. You just, your brain won't be able to help it. But hopefully we can help you with some ideas to help make it a better experience. Because it, what we say in that, it, so many of those situations, if you're distracted by that ceiling fan or the fact that they're making you dizzy because they're moving the whole time, what are you focused on? The distraction. And if you're focused on the distraction, then you're not paying attention to what is actually going on and the communication that's, that's trying to happen. But unfortunately, some of us still aren't very comfortable being on Zoom or any other virtual platform because of working the technology. Maybe it's being on camera that makes us nervous. Maybe it's not being face-to-face. -face. So we have a poll for those of you at home that you can participate in as well, because we want to get a sense from you here and those of you at home, what is it that's kind of hanging you up, if you will, or, or, or getting in your way? Is it the, the not being face-to-face? -face? That, that just makes it so hard because we just, you know, as, as uh, Abigail said earlier, she's a hugger. It's so hard to have to walk up to somebody and say, oh, you know, I can't hug you. So is, is it the fact that you're afraid of hitting the wrong button or is it something else? And we'd love to see kind of... It's the pull up. Okay. It's the pull up. 
And if not, we can keep moving yeah. on. If, and for those of you at home, if you have comments that you want to make, we would love for you just to put it in the chat and we have people looking at it so that we can add that to the conversation. And if you have questions, for sure put them in the Q&A and they'll be monitoring, and uh, Kristen and Hannah are monitoring that for us so that we can answer those questions as we go. Okay, oh, sure. great. So this is all from different people. Um, not being face to face, still kind of weird. Mm -hmm. Juggling time and tech between my job and school. Mm -hmm. Not being able to read the crowd. I hate to hear my, oh, thank you. I hate to hear my voice if the internet lags. It creates a loop that interferes with my thoughts. Wow, they're really coming in. Hold on. And so many times it's not even what the obvious things that you think of, you know, that besides the fact if you have children and you're trying to manage, you know, their schoolwork. And I, I was talking to somebody the other day and they said, uh, this was, you know, the, the, the professional woman, she said, today we had our first day of second grade. We talked about our animals and we talked <laughs> about this and, you know, she's in second grade again because she's having to do this with her children. So there are so many other factors that come up, but we just know that there's so many things that make it more difficult. I have an exercise I'd like for you to do, and you're going to laugh a little bit or wonder or think I've lost my mind. I know your phone's not too far away. Everyone has one. Grab your phone Grab if your you phone, would. Pull it out. This is the one time you're in a, in, a, in a presentation that you're actually asked to bring your phone out. And take a quick selfie of yourself, not smiling. She's setting you up for failure. I am. I am. I'll, yes, I am. However, hopefully the information will be very insightful. And I know it's actually a little bit hard when you have a mask on. So imagine, well, I'll ask you that in a second. Okay, everybody done? Yep. Okay, so take a look at your picture. Now, with a mask on, it's hard to see it, but just imagine how was your mouth when you took the picture? You can still tell through your eyes a lot of times. A little bit, yeah, exactly, because you smile through your eyes a lot of times. How do, so imagine, how do you think the expression on your face looked? Did you look happy? Did you look excited to be there? Did you look annoyed? Do you look bored? Irritated? Something in between? Anyone? Focused? Focused. Okay. 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 What else? When you, just know if you were looking at yourself in the mirror and you weren't smiling, how do you come across? Do you look what? Mean. Mm -hmm. That's super common because we just have that straight face. Depressed. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yes. Depressed, tired, annoyed. Yeah. So just know that when you are joining a, a meeting, a virtual meeting, or you're you know, walking into that virtual room, that's the, ex that's the expression that, you're, that people are first seeing. And just think about, is that the impression that I'm trying to make? Because oftentimes that face can be giving off a different message than what you might intend. So Thanks. what I... And, and so many times when we're on a virtual meeting, we're, we're, we're worried about our, our camera, we're adjusting the, the, I mean the, uh, the computer, and we're adjusting our lighting, and uh, does this look okay? Oh, hi, everybody. I'm glad that we're here. I'm glad that you're here with me, and then you're okay. But the first thing they see, that first impression they see is you with that look of consternation on your face without a mask, <laughs> and it just doesn't look good, and it's not very welcoming. It's not very... What Kim and I like to say is that you never get a second chance to make a good first impression. And that's a terrible first impression. So the answer to that is, is think about having just a little bit of a grin. It's a little harder for me to show you since you can't, this is with my mask on. But just imagine, it just takes a couple little muscles and where you have a grin. It doesn't have to be a big toothy smile because that gets uncomfortable. Frankly, if you smile too, much, too long, your cheeks start hurting. And it might not look natural, especially depending on if you're just entering economics class, it's not like, <laughs> hey, oh my gosh, it's economics, woohoo, you know, so, you know, that, you may not get that excited about it, so certainly a smile is always a great thing to have on your face, but just having that little grin can make such a difference in how you come across to the people that you're communicating with, and that, I think, makes them feel more comfortable and makes you feel more welcoming as well. And so many times, whether you're an extrovert or an introvert, there's a little bit of nervousness because you're on camera. You don't really enjoy being on camera. You don't like being on camera. 
you're not sure about the crowd, you're not sure about the other people in the room, or is everybody looking at you, is everybody pointing at you being the overhead light guy, <laughs> what is it, and you're nervous. Because that different parts of your personality rise up to make you feel better, you become a laugher, or a leaner, a rambler, a reader, a nervous Nelly, an ummer, a whisperer, a liker, so many different things that happen that make you feel better, but they hurt, they hamper your ways to connect with the audience, to connect with the person on the other side of the lens. And that's the biggest thing you have to avoid. You have to be your true self and look your best so that all you have to worry about is what you say. Because if you think about it, it's just like your body language as well. What are you saying with your body language and are your expressions and does it connect and, and is it congruent to what you're actually intending to? Now, the second reason why I wanted you to take that selfie, so take a look at it again, and look at what who am at? I looking at? And what I mean by that is when you took the picture, were you looking at yourself in the screen or are you looking up at the camera lens? Anybody want to share? Looking, looking up, up at the camera lens? Good, good job. Good job. At yourself. Because uh -huh. totally. we're used to looking in the mirror. Yeah, totally So it's only normal. natural. It's like you're looking in the mirror. We all do that every day. So that's what we naturally do when we look into the, the iPhone camera. The challenge is, though, with the computer, or whether you're on your computer or your phone, if you want to make eye contact with someone, you have to look at the lens. Because I would never go up to Mike in person and say, oh my gosh, it is so good to finally get to see you. We're going to have this great conversation. That would feel weird. Same thing for you, y'all you know, at home. If I looked over here and said, oh my gosh, I'm so good to meet you. I'm so glad to be here to present this to you. And we're going to share all this great information. Do you see there's a disconnect? And it feels weird. It looks, com feels completely unnatural to have to look at that lens instead of, especially when you're on a virtual meeting where you see all the people, whether it's your class or the meeting that you're in, you know, you want to look down and talk to Hannah. But if, I'm, if I want her to feel like I'm talking right to her and I want everybody to feel like I'm talking right to them, each and every one of them, I have to look up at the camera. And it feels super weird, but that's how we know to make eye contact because how do we build relationships and make those connections? It's by making eye contact. And that's how you do it when you're on camera versus when you're in person, you know, similar to when you're different than when you're in person. So you've got a picture of that person on the other side of that lens. Look at them. Now, when they're talking, you can look down because, again, you're making eye contact. That way they're looking at you, you're looking at them. But when you're talking, for most of the time, doesn't mean you have to stare at the camera the entire time. It's a staring contest. Who's going to blink first? You can look down if you need to look down at your notes. If you need to look down because you have this incredible story to tell, you want to see their reaction, but always come back up. Look at that lens. Because the biggest challenge with virtual, which I'm sure you've been very well aware of, is that it's so much harder to read, read social cues and that body language of the other person. And that's why we have, and because there's a lag, we often have that, you know, pe people step on each other or in, actually, accidentally interrupt each other because, you know, usually when you're in person, you can kind of anticipate that kind of give and take of the conversation, which is much harder to do when you're virtual. Let's talk about the camera setup. How many people have you seen it's the up the nose shot that you saw earlier. It's me on the left where I have the laptop down near my knees. I just push that laptop back and I'm shooting up my nose. I don't care how handsome or beautiful you are, nobody looks good with an up the nose shot. So you just gotta make sure that no matter what you're using, you bring that camera lens up pretty close to eye level. Here, I'm still a couple of inches short, even though I'm on a box and a couple of big baseball books, but I'm pretty close to eye level because when you're talking to somebody, you wanna basically be on the same plane as them because directors in movies taught us a long time ago, if you wanna make somebody look inferior or superior, you shoot up at them or shoot down on them. Here, you wanna be on the same plane as the person you're communicating with. And that makes such a huge difference. And again, building that connection, because what are we trying to do? in any kind of communication as we're trying to build relationships, we're trying to build that rapport. Another thing that we need to be sure of is that they can see you well, because if they can't see you well, it's going to be hard to, uh, to be able to see your eyes and be able to connect. It's not turning, oh, there we go. No? It's not clicking. Brian, can you forward that for us? There we go. Thank you. This is an extreme example, but if you're sitting in front of a window with more light in back of you than in front of you, this is what can happen. And if we're trying to make eye contact and make that connection, it's really difficult to see if we can't see your eyes. 
So the trick is with lighting is think about having more light in front of you than behind you. And sometimes, you know, with a, with a, with a, a window, you think, oh, I've got this pretty backyard or I want them to see, you know, what's outside. What happens though is the camera's iris down because there's so much bright light, it thinks, ooh, we don't need much light, and then your face gets dark. And so we want, you, we want your face to be lit. We don't want all that extra background, that, that extra you know, brightness in the background because we want to be able to see you. And you want to think about your background too. Yeah, you want to make sure that there's nothing distracting in the background. Sometimes we can't help it if we're at home or someplace that we're, we, we can't set up a background but we don't want horns to come out of our head because of the picture behind us. We don't want something that's so busy that everyone's looking at the background going, wow, look, he's got 20 books. Let's see what books he's been reading. <laughs> don't listen to a thing that, that you say. So you wanna make sure your background, while it looks good, is also not distracting so they're not, not hearing you. Like Kim just said, if they're, if they're distracted, they don't hear what you say and they're missing something very important. And while there are other things to consider besides you know, the, how to make that connection and your background and your lighting, and your angles, which are all really important. That will help prepare you for you know, knowing that you're gonna look good. There's other things to consider like your audio and, and some other things as well. But now you're kind of ready to think about, oh, now I can communicate. And what can often happen is that we start getting those nerves come up. But one thing I want you to keep in mind is that physiologically, when we're nervous, what happens? We, our palms might get sweaty, our heart races, our, we get butterflies in our stomach. Interestingly, also, when we're excited about something, we're really excited about something, what also happens? Our palms sweat, our heart races, we get butterflies. So if you can kind of help yourself think about it in that way where, huh, okay, I'm gonna feel the same either way. Why not take those feelings that might be more, a little bit more of nerves, let me just help myself understand that that's actually just excited. I'm just excited to get to present because I'll, remember too, when you're presenting, there's usually a reason because you know what you're talking about. You're the expert. And so own that, know that, and that can often help you take, turn that nervousness into excitement because you're getting to look at this as an opportunity to share what you know. You've taken care now of everything that, that you can control. You've taken care of the, the camera, the camera angle, the lighting, the background. You look great. You shouldn't be nervous about that again, like Kim said. Be confident because you know what you're talking about. But now it's a matter of how do you say it? And we tell so many people that it's one thing to be in person where we're three-dimensional. But for some reason, when you're talking through that camera lens, we're looking at that camera and we're going through that into this two-dimensional uh, stratosphere of, of the virtual platform, we lose just a little something. We lose some energy. And we also then uh, can get into sort of a... Uh, we just can kind of forget where we are or, or what we're talking about because it just feels unnatural to be having that conversation when you're virtual. So whenever you can think about, even if you're doing a presentation for school, how can I be conversational? Because what happens is that when we try to memorize, one, it's really hard. Has anybody done theater where you're having to remember long, long lines or had to memorize poetry or things for school? It's hard. Right, it's hard, it takes a lot of practice. So when, and what happens is that when we memorize something, if we get to a, a point and we had planned and written out and practiced this word and a different word just comes out, what happens? We often just, it just goes downhill from there because we just have, we get off our rhythm. So the more you can just be conversational and because it's just gonna be easier for the person that you're communicating with and it also doesn't come across as You've just memorized something. And if you've ever watched young, or not young, but inexperienced news reporters, and they're doing a live shot somewhere, sometimes it looks like they're literally like reading off their eyelids. So your eyes get kind of this glazed look because you're focusing so much on remembering exactly the words that you're gonna say. So we always try to say, you know, have a plan, but don't memorize it per se, because it's just gonna make it really, it's really hard to do that well. As you know from listening to someone read, anytime someone reads something, rehearses something, memorizes something, they don't come across quite as genuine, quite as natural. You want to talk to someone just like you're, you're talking to them one-on-one. -on -one. Hey, Kim, how are you doing today? As opposed to, hi, Kim, how are you today? A little bit of a difference there. Yeah, and it doesn't mean that you get so lax and you know, casual necessarily, depending on the what, what the situation is. If it's a professional environment, you're presenting for school, 
obviously you want to have a little bit more of a presentation mode, if you will, but it can still sound more conversational than memorized, if that makes sense. As we said earlier, be confident. Be confident about what you know, but be confident because no one knows that you're nervous. No one knows that there are some butterflies there. So own that and just know that they're here to listen to you. If I'm nervous right now, I can't show it because I know you're all here listening to some, to some introvert talk about how to be an extrovert. It's okay. So you just have to own what you're doing and know that, that they don't know how nervous you are. So just be confident that you know a lot about the subject matter, whether you're the, the, the teacher, the student, just part of the, the discussion, one-on-one -on -one with somebody, a job interview, whatever it may be, be confident that you know what you're doing. Same as if you're one-on-one -on -one in person, now you're just with the, with the camera and you can get it done. And you can also remember that they don't know what you're planning to say. Unless you had to turn in your exact presentation, if you will, if you say it a little differently, they don't know. So just own the fact that you know your content and as long as you get the gist of what you had intended to share, then they're going to be able to get the gist of what you were trying to share. Who has challenges with crutch words? Anybody? What, and what are your favorite, does anybody have a favorite crutch word? And does anybody, do you know what I mean I, by crutch word? I mentioned the liker when I was talking about the rambler, the reader and all that. The liker is the person who says like, like twice in every sentence. Like. Crutch words could be um, or so, or like, or now, or you know, just whatever those words are that we use that literally the only purpose they serve generally is to give our brains just a split second to catch up. I'm somebody who my brain gets ahead of me or my mouth gets ahead of me I, and I got to like pause so that I can catch back up. So let's talk about crutch words. So uh, what's your favorite crutch word? So I, I think a big crutch word for everyone is so. So what else, what do you think? Say, I say it between every sentence because I'm nervous. So I'm, I'm not sure exactly what I'm gonna say next. So I use the word so. And that gives my mind just a split second to catch up. So the easiest, so, the, the, <laughs> and, 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 and the truth is those words have places sometimes if you're saying, now we're going to be doing this next step. Well, that's appropriate. If you say now in front of every sentence, it's not necessarily uh, what you, maybe you had intended. So know that some of those words in and of themselves are fine. It's not a big deal if you say um every once in a while or if you say like, there's a place for that for sure. It's just when they become so repetitive or used so often that it becomes a little bit of a distraction. I had a person tell me recently that they had a boss that literally the team would actually start like placing bets before a president, before he spoke of how many times he was gonna say um, because he just said it so many times. So if we're counting the number of ums somebody is saying, what are we doing? Exactly, we're counting the ums, we're not listening. So you just wanna make sure, make it so that it doesn't become a distraction. And the easiest way to make that happen is just to make it part of the way you communicate. Practicing. If you are in everyday conversation thinking about it and can hear them coming, try to pause and keep going. If it's in the middle of the sentence, that actually might sound more awkward if you are in the middle of the sentence and then you stop to finish your thought. But most of the time, it just needs to be, it's just a habit, that's all it is. And or just a little bit, again, of just a little crutch. So the more you can practice it in your everyday life, in your everyday conversations, that becomes just the way you communicate. Because when we are stressed or nervous or uncomfortable, we can't be focusing on both things of what are the words we're trying to say and what, what, what am I trying to get across? And oh yeah, don't say crutch words. You can't think of all those things at the same time. So as much as that just becomes the way you normally communicate, then that doesn't become an issue. And when you're in person, other things are happening. You, you hear the other person breathing. You, you hear other people in the room. You see the other person reacting to what you have to say. So it doesn't seem to take as long. But when you, it's just you, it's just you and that computer, you're on Zoom and you're talking and you're not sure where you're going to go next. And you're not going to say so, so you're just being quiet. And then you keep talking because you realize what you're going to say. But that silence seemed like it was five seconds. It may have been six. Did y'all time that? <laughs> that was so long. It was a half a second. It was like a split second. 
it was nothing. But when you're silent and there's no one else in the room, it's just you in your room on the camera on Zoom and you, you're silent for a split second. Wow, that was an eternity. Did you hear that? <laughs> it feels really awkward. Yeah, because, and that's what we do is we want to just fill that space. So just try to yeah, you, refrain. You've got to understand it's not an eternity. It's a split second. It just sounds like you took a breath. Mm -hmm. The person you're talking to doesn't matter. I mean, doesn't, doesn't care. They accept that. They know what you're doing because they do the same thing. It's just like taking a breath in the conversation. Do that, and you're going to connect so much better. And oftentimes, that pause gives the other person time to catch up and soak in what it was that you were saying. So the pause is a great way. There's so many uses for a good pause when you're presenting. But it may, a lot of times, it just helps them you know, kind of be that the, uh, the, the cadence of the conversation, kind of the, the going back and forth. So we hope that these have given you, there's a whole lot more that we could go into. We tried to cram as much as we could in this short amount of time. Hopefully this helps you feel a little bit more prepared about making sure that you're going to look good. No, you know, no up the nose shots uh, <laughs> moving forward. And we hope that this gives you just some tools to help you actually look and be excited about virtual opportunities that you may have before you. And we have a free virtual checklist on our website, barnsteinmedia.com slash virtual. So if you need to print that out, put it next to your computer for every time you're on a Zoom meeting or a Zoom class and just make sure everything looks good. Background, lighting, okay, we're good. I'm gonna yeah. be ready, I'm confident, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm secure. Just a little checklist you can have, simple checklist you can have just to be able to check, check the boxes. And then if you feel like you could use a little bit more help, uh, if there are businesses that think, hey, we could really use some assistance with helping our, our, our internal training or whether it's our customer facing people, we do have uh, programs available where we can work with companies, especially we customize trainings for them. And we also have a super fun and effective 10 day online on camera challenge and coaching program. That's right, over the course of two weeks, Monday through Friday, Monday through Friday, you get to watch a training video. It's only about 10 minutes long. It's self paced, so you can watch it anytime throughout the day. It's not like you have to be up at eight o'clock in the morning to watch it. And you watch the training video and then you tape, record a video of yourself, put it on a private Facebook page. We give you feedback about it and then you do the same thing the next day. The difference between day one and day five is amazing. Day one and day 10, you wouldn't believe the difference in how much more confident and better at connecting with someone people are talking on camera. And we've had, it's been so fun to see just the range of students. We've had everybody from gym owners to professional speakers to corporate trainers to coaches to business people, insurance agents, recruiters. I mean, just everybody. It's been really fun to see just if, you, if being on camera is something that you feel like, hey, I really want to up my game, whether it's for virtual presentations and or for being able to create videos as well. That's a really super fun program. And we have our next group starting on Monday. I've seen so many coaches since March be on camera because they're on a Zoom interview and they're shooting up the nose. They have a window behind them. Can't I'm, hear them very well. I've actually tweeted to a couple of them. I, Hard Knocks, if y'all watch the Hard Knocks show on HBO, Anthony Lynn from the Chargers, I want to send him a note because he's shooting up his nose with a window behind him. I'm like, <laughs> coach, really? I wish I knew you because I wish I could get you to join our course because you would look so much better. Maybe not with your players. Maybe your players don't care. I think they would, but definitely talking to the media where your interview is going to be on everywhere around Los Angeles, people care. And it just makes you look so much better. And it's those subtle things. You know, just how when you have a conversation in person, you might walk away from some conversations, or maybe it's even a professor that you have, that you walk away and you think, yeah, I just didn't really connect with them. And you don't necessarily know why. Sometimes it could be that they never looked at you in the eye the whole time, or just maybe they did something that was, felt a little bit awkward. The same thing can happen on camera as well. So if there's a ceiling fan going on, you know, behind your head, or you're shooting up your nose, or there's a window, they may not be able to articulate why they didn't connect the same as they might have normally. They just know that they didn't connect. So that's why it's so many of these things we feel like are so important and so helpful, like the making eye contact, the hashtag look at the lens, because we just feel like it just, we just want to take away any of the potential for somebody not to make that connection with us. And there's so many opportunities with video to make the connection better or to make it more challenging. All right, so questions. What questions do you have? If you have questions, if you're here, you can come up and ask it into the uh, microphone so that people can hear you. If you're on Zoom, you can put it in chat and we'll hear it from there. Any questions? Surely questions? you have questions. 
I have a question. Okay. I would like you both to tell us your biggest professional presentation blunder okay. when you didn't do any of the techniques you just told us we should do. Oh my gosh. Oh goodness. Well, actually, it's that's funny that you blunder. said that because I actually now, like, I have two that pop to mind on television. Right off the bat, I can't think of. I don't know that I've had as many in person. I can't think of too many in person, but I can absolutely. This is super embarrassing, and I'll just tell you. There was one day, I've lived in Texas since I was four. I've eaten Mexican food a million times. And there was one night I was anchoring and the words prop, you know, pop up on the screen on my teleprompter and I could not pronounce the word tortilla. If you look at it, T-O-R-T-I-L-L-A, it, like, it just doesn't look like it sounds. And I... I stumbled on that and I like, thankfully I kind of laughed through it, but for the life of me, I could not say the word tortilla. It was em so embarrassing. And, I, and again, I've eaten a lot of Mexican food. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know how to say tortilla and I just, for whatever reason, you know how there's some words that you look of as one of those words. When you look at O-F, it just doesn't look like that's how it should say. And so when you see it, it written, I don't know, for some reason I couldn't say tortilla one day. I have so many stories I could tell you because I've embarrassed myself so many times on TV. Uh, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> I, I could spend all day telling you stories about Okay, just think of one. Yeah, you know, one, uh, back in 1990, I went live at a UT baseball game, and I tossed through the highlights. You know, I, I'm live in the stands. It was during a doubleheader, second game of a doubleheader. Second game's going on, so I'm going to show first game highlights, and I tossed through the highlights. Uh, let's take a look at the highlights, blah, 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 blah. Well, the, the, there was an engineer helping me, and he was actually holding – little bitty uh, television right. so I could watch the highlights. Well, he hit a button and he changed to <laughs> channel 36. I, I was on KVU 24. So I look down and I'm looking at the highlights. And I, I see the sports guy from channel 36. Well, I'm on live TV. So, you know, Nora, I go, hey, change the channel back to us. <laughs> I, I'm on live TV. I couldn't do that. So I think I'm in highlights. So I'm, I'm visualizing the highlights that I just edited in the live band. In my head, I'm saying, you know, Dave Lowry with this single to drive in, uh, you know, whoever it was, Tolson, blah, blah, blah. And as I'm saying it, I'm visualizing, but I'm, I'm doing this to the, the engineer <laughs> like that. <clears throat> well, I, I knew it was terrible because I'm trying to visualize these highlights and I know it's not going well and I finish up and blah, 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 blah. I go back to the station and I look and the director, when I say, let's go to the highlights, he didn't go to the highlights. He kept me up for another 15 seconds. So for 15 seconds, you saw me doing this on, on TV. That was very interesting. Yeah, and, and we were just, we were so fortunate that we didn't have YouTube yet. Because oh, I'm pretty sure that some of these things, I'm sure that tortilla, YouTube. yeah, that, tor that tortilla stumble, I'm sure would have been viral. So thankfully, we did not have that. Let's see, is it okay to not share your video when attending in a group setting? If others are, that's a good question. And I assume that's for like for uh, a meeting. I think it kind of depends on the expectation of the, the group. And if you're the host, you can, you, know, you can sort of say, I'd really like for everybody to you know, turn their camera on so that we can see everybody. It is harder because it's so, it is so visual, obviously, and we're at home and there could be crazy stuff going on around us. Or if you're running late and you really are trying to get ready still, so I think that sometimes when I turn my camera off, when it's a meeting that everybody else has it on, I might send a private message to the host just to say, hey, I'm eating lunch. Or, yeah, I'm eating right now, so I have my camera off. And then I'll try to turn it back on. But normally, I think it's, it just makes everybody, everybody likes getting to see everybody's faces. So I think that it's helpful, if you can, to be able to leave your camera on. Yeah, exactly. Kim and I do this on Zoom all the time. I have a faith-based message that I share on Zoom. Uh, every once in a while, and it's it's good, even though we're not looking at the person while we're talking, we're looking at the lens. But all the the you know peripheral vision, we still see the person. We still see someone over here, you know, in those twenty five or fifty boxes on the on the screen. We can still see somebody over there nodding their head when we say something that they should agree with, or huh, yeah, I can't believe that either. You, you see the reaction. So if all we see is the 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 dark screen with the words or the dark screen with the picture, you're like. Right, it's, okay. more, it's more fun, for, it's more engaging for the yeah, presenter, too. For the presenter, for the person who's talking, it's like, okay, do you not care? Do you not really want a beer? Did you leave because we bored you so you're not sure? So because of that, I would recommend, if you can, to leave your uh, mm -hmm. camera on. And certainly if you're part of a meeting where you need to be 
participating, it helps if you have your camera on just because then they can kind of read, you can kind of anticipate that body language and those social cues a little bit better. Let's see, some, Melissa asks, how do you get your energy when presenting virtually, especially when you're using a slideshow so you can't see your audience? In a webinar format, like we're doing today, where you're mostly just seeing, you're just seeing us and our slides, it can feel, especially if you're at home, which is where you know, typically you'll be, we have the benefit of having a live audience, so we can feel like we're really talking to people here. But it is tricky because you feel like it's just me and the computer. Is anybody watching? Is anybody listening? I think that one of the ways that helps me keep my energy up is by trying to get participation from the audience, even when they can just type in the chat, because that makes you feel like you're actually talking to people. And certainly some of it is just literally kind of getting yourself revved up, if you will, a little bit just to have that energy and imagining if I was in person, how would my audience be reacting? How would, would they be laughing now? Is this kind of a funny part or is this a serious part? You can kind of anticipate that a little bit and I think that kind of helps you keep your energy and, and I sometimes laugh too that if you need to, you know, decide does it help you if you're standing up or is it better to sit down? Do you need to do a little dance or a little jig before you present because it just kind of gets your energy flowing? You know, do I need to take a couple of deep breaths? Whatever it is that works best for you to be able to really help you be at your best, I think is kind of the rule of thumb that I use. Yeah. Here's a good question. Do you have any tips for overcoming anxiety when speaking to a large crowd? I have survived briefing a squadron of a thousand plus and bombed a briefing of only 50 where I almost passed out. Help. I hate to say this, but trust me, from a shy introvert, it's mind over matter. And, and I realize that. And, and you just have to have confidence that the, the reason why the people are listening to you, whether it's 50 or 1,000 or 80,000, is they're there to hear what you have to say. So you have to be confident about that. It's not like you walked in a room, hey, I'm glad y'all are here. I want to talk about Jeff Burroughs. He's my favorite baseball player of all time. Y'all are like, Who, I, what? and half of you are going to leave, and the other half of you are going to go to sleep, and I'm going to go... Oh, and I'm going to start panicking and I'm not going to like this. So, you know, that's a completely different story. But here, y'all are here because you want to hear us. And if you're tuning into a Zoom meeting, it's because you want to hear what we have to say. And if, if you're the leader of a squadron or the leader of a group, they want to hear what you have to say. So have confidence in that. And I know that sounds easier said than done, but it really is mind over matter. And I can't tell you how many times in, in high school and college I would be sitting in a chair talking with a teacher or a professor or to, to a group, and I would have to hold onto that chair because I felt like I'm about to fall out because this is just killing me. Oh my gosh, this is tough. And I understand that, but then I've realized that I, I had the confidence of the fact that, that when I'm speaking, again, in a, in a setting like this, have the confidence that they're here to listen to you. They respect you, they respect what you have to say, or you hope that they do, so, so treat it that way. It's not like you're just out of nowhere, just, hey, I want to talk about the Texas Rangers. Who, who, oh, y'all don't like the Rangers. Uh, and then you're nervous about it. Have the confidence that they're here to listen to you because you're the expert, because you're the, the one who knows everything or knows most of it, and they want to hear from you. And some of it takes practice. It just, it, it, it's the fact of actually doing it. And I will say that sometimes in a large group of, you know, a thousand, if you're on a stage especially, you just see sort of a blur of people, where sometimes for me, it could be even more nerve wracking when it's a small group because then I can see everybody's eyes. Yeah. And so that, so know that that might make you, like it may make certain people more uncomfortable because you can actually be trying to pay attention to, do they look bored, are they interested, are they texting, what are they doing? Yeah. So sometimes again, it just becomes, the practice of it and just getting used to different scenarios, I think as well. Do you have a question? Do you want to ask it up here? Let me tell while you're coming up, let me tell you, you can go and come up. Let me tell you one more thing about that is that again, I have a faith based, faith based message that I've shared more than 60 times over the last year about losing my job and, and all sorts of things. But as I've given it, and I've, most of it, uh, other than the last you know, four months or so have been in person, you know, a room like this, maybe a bigger crowd, maybe a smaller crowd, but a room like this to where I'll, I'll see people, I'll see their eyes. And as I'm telling stories, and, and some of it is very personal and heartfelt, and some of it is funny, and I'll tell a funny story about my fifth grade girlfriend breaking up with me in sixth grade, and I'm expecting a laugh. And everyone laughs except for that one person. And I'm like, I can't believe she didn't laugh, but I, okay. I'll, so I go on, I, I talk about seventh grade football, and, 
and how I was third string at first, and it just killed me, and everyone laughs, except for that one person. And inside of your, your mind, you're thinking, okay, she hates me. Why is she even here? I can't believe this is the worst thing ever. I, nothing I say gets through to her. I can't believe this. And you, you kind of beat yourself up over it. But you can't do that for two reasons. Number one is you can't let that bother you. You just have to go on because I learned this a long time ago as a, as a person on TV that you cannot keep 100% of the audience happy. It's impossible. If you can get 99, you're doing incredible. If you get 70, you're doing really well. But you're going to have at least one person who's not going to be completely in tune or agree with what you're having to say. So you just have to get that out of your mind and realize you're talking in sports, you're talking about someone to someone who's not a Longhorn fan or not a Ranger fan or not a Cowboy fan. So no matter what you say, they're not going to like it. That's number one. But number two, and I found this out, literally I could tell you so many stories about those 60 plus uh, messages that I've shared is that I've finished my message. I say, amen, we're done. And different people come up to me. Leading the way is usually that person who didn't, didn't do a thing. It was like acting like they hated me the entire time. Thank you so much. I, Mike, I really appreciate that message. That, oh, that really hit me really right here. Like, really? <laughs> didn't seem that way. So again, you, you can't let that get into your head when you're looking at people's reactions because we all react to things differently. So I hope that answers the question there on, uh, on uh, Zoom. What's your question? It was kind of like for you, like what kind of like inspired you to do like sports analysis and like, have you ever had any conflict with like players or coaches and stuff off of video games <laughs> oh, that like you said? I could tell you lots of stories about that. What inspired me, I, I was a big sports fan growing up. That's why I wanted to be a sportscaster. Uh, when I was around 10 years old, I could tell you the exact date probably. Uh, Which I, is what makes him good yeah, as a sportscaster. I wanted to be, I wanted to be quarterback for the Dallas date. I wanted to be quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys. I wanted to be right holder for the Texas Rangers. And I wanted to be a sportscaster. And around 1977, I thought I could do all three at the same time. I had my schedule figured out. I'd be a sportscaster from February <laughs> to you know, end of March, and then baseball season would start, then football season, and it would work perfectly. Realized after that, that football and baseball may have been good, but not that good. But sports casting, I could keep, keep going. Uh, I could tell you lots of stories about uh, having problems, so to speak, with coaches and players. Not that I had that many, because I treated them fairly. But no matter what you do, you're going to say something that they take the wrong way, or you're going to, or you're going to release information that they don't think should be released yet, or say something a certain way that they don't think. You just have to be fair to everybody. Mm -hmm. That was the biggest thing I learned mm -hmm. is to be fair. And that, that kept me basically in, in good, good standing with basically all of them. Was that like a with oh, sure. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, there, there was one. It's a long story, but there was one time when I, I, tried to, I tried to defend a player. It was in 1994. I tried to defend a player on, on TV. But what I said was, sounded very negative because I talked about his past that had to do with using drugs. Well, all kinds of people called in, viewers called in wanting me fired. UT called, it was about a UT player. UT wanted to have a word with me. They weren't happy with me. I go down and I talk to the player. He's like, how could you say that I was, I'm going to get start using drugs? Like, you told me two years ago when I did a story on you that you used to deal drugs. So if you got cut from the team, if you got released, I'm, I'm saying that I'd be worried that you'd go back to that life. I'm trying to defend you. It's like, oh, oh, okay. Thanks, Mike. See, again, people don't hear everything. Mm -hmm. So, uh, again, sometimes, sometimes you say things on, on TV or on Zoom or whatever platform you're on. People don't either grasp everything or don't know the whole backstory of everything. Mm -hmm. So you just have to be careful with what you say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just how much context do people have? And if they don't have all the context or if they don't hear everything, it can lead to yeah. challenges. Okay, any other questions? Or have you gotten any questions in the Q&A? That's it. I see yeah. the chat. I don't see the Q and A. Can you? Okay, okay, got it. Okay, anybody else have questions? Yes. Or you can shout it, and we'll we'll repeat it. As we've gotten used to presenting, what's our go-to to beforehand to calm down and be ready? Mm -hmm. I think so much of this is a little bit of trial and error and figuring out what is it that I need to do. Am I trying to, am I normally a super quiet and laid back and, and not, the hard part is that you still need to be yourself, whatever, however you are. On camera, what happens is that you lose a little bit, that get, there's just energy that's lost in the translation. 
So for those, of, for those people who are watching us from home, they may be feeling that we're a little less energetic than you might watching us in person. Across, in person. And so it's one, being aware of that. So again, like I said earlier, if it helps you to do jumping jacks, do the power pose. If you've ever heard of, there's a great TED talk about the, uh, Amy, Amy Cuddy, I think is her name, does the power pose. If you need to you know, do something that revs you up, frankly, a lot of times I say a prayer and I just say, Lord, help me just be, uh, be able to be, bring value and help serve in a way that I can today. So I think it just is whatever you, whatever will get you excited. Is it, do I need to look at my notes real quick or do I not because that makes me more nervous? Do I feel like I already have my plan and I've kind of got my, you know, I know my chunks that I'm talking about so I can feel confident in it and reminding yourself that you know your stuff. I think the more, there, there's, there's, a, there's a point at which you wanna be prepared so you know your stuff and not to the extreme of where you feel like you're memorized. Does that make a difference? There's a, there's a little bit, there's a difference there. There's kind of a fine line between being prepared and overly memorized. It's definitely a personal choice, choice of yours that you can't compare to anybody, where you may see him drop down and do 25 push-ups, and that makes him ready to go. She says a prayer, you know, he, he takes a lap, he does the Wonder Woman pose, or she does the Wonder Woman pose. <laughs> well, he can do the Wonder Woman does, pose. Yeah. Everyone does something different, and you can't look at, at anyone and say, oh, well, he or she did that, so I guess I need to do that, mm -hmm. so I'm as good as them, because we all have different personalities. Uh, I'll tell you another funny story. You've heard of Mother Ginger, the... the the, uh, it's from the uh, Nutcracker. The Nutcracker uh, play, ballet. Uh, ballet, the, uh, how do you want to describe it? The, it, it? It's at Christmas every year here in Austin. Well, and they have it everywhere, yeah. but the Nutcracker is the, the famous ballet. Yeah, and Mother Ginger is, you know, a character in it, and they, they bring a quote-unquote celebrity in every night to be, the, to be Mother Ginger. Well, I got lucky enough to be Mother Ginger one time about 10 years ago. And they bring me in. And, yeah, they put they put makeup all over me, and oh, you couldn't have recognized him. The crazy. two kids were, you know, much younger. You know, they were around ten, nine, eight, seven, that age. So they were they were young, and they enjoyed. Oh, watch me get all mess, all made up, and you know, big, big wig and big, big old gigantic dress on, and I, I get into the suit. Anyway, I get up there, and and I'm behind. I'm backstage where they're about to open up the curtain. I'm about to come out. And I'm sitting there, and part of me is nervous, and part of me is like, okay, God, just do what you do, and just help me through this. I'm going to be okay. Because there were no words. He didn't have to yeah, say all, anything. All, all but you're supposed to be super, you know, it's acting. I mean, it's acting, which so, is much different but, than being a sportscaster. Yes. But, uh, so I'm sitting there, and, and I am as calm as I've ever been in my life, I think, which is usually most of the time. But I'm super calm, and one of the ladies who was working there looks up at me and you know because i'm up in the the costume and she says in all my years i've never seen a mother ginger as relaxed as you are oh, can't tell you i don't know anyway i went out and i'm not saying i did a good job i didn't get booed off the stage but i was calm about it i just tried to enjoy it it was not my thing it was not my style it was definitely <laughs> not an introvert's <laughs> place to be but i knew that's it's where god wanted me to be at the time so I, I tried to enjoy it. I tried not to let anything bother me, and I did. That would have been better if, if Kim had been doing it. Maybe she would have said a prayer about it. Maybe she would have done jumping jacks. Maybe she would have done something else. We all would have done something differently at that time to feel better about what we're about to do. So I'm using a long story to tell you that whatever anyone does doesn't mean that's what you should do. Maybe you get a tip from them, like, oh, let me try that and see if it mm -hmm. works. Mm -hmm. But just because they do something and it works for them doesn't mean it's going to work for you. Mm -hmm. Find what's best for you mm -hmm. and your personality. And, and another idea is that you could even just, you know, does it help you to take, you know, five really deep breaths so that it just kind of brings your nervous system down? Or does that make you too relaxed? Because for some people that could be very calming. Other people, it could just almost bring them down too much. Sometimes because I do a lot of voiceover work as well, I do, like, I, I stretch my mouth where I do yeah, A, E, I, O, U. You know, and I'll do these where if you saw me in my car as I'm driving somewhere, you'd laugh at me. But thankfully, everybody just thinks you're talking on your phone when you do things in your car now and talk to yourself. But, but I'll just I'll do things to stretch my mouth so that I feel like I'm going to be able to articulate better. 
So I think it's just trying some different things and figuring out what works for me. Yes. Last question, I think. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Well, luckily we've been married for 28 and a half years, so uh, so because of that, I, I know where to... He, he's used to me talking I, I, for him. Exactly. So. I know where to find my little places to put my yeah. comments in. So yeah. Like in the beginning, then, like, how, do, how did you like, learn how to like, jump in to like, a conversation? And, like, uh, again, it goes back to confidence and the fact that you know, if, if Kim was talking about something that I knew nothing about or didn't care to know about or have no confidence about, I'd probably sit here and I wouldn't say a word for an hour. Oh, I've taken him to cocktail ahead. parties or, or you know, whatever, Go and ahead. he doesn't say a word. Mm -hmm. People are like, what's wrong with yeah. him? Like, he, he had nothing to say, so he just yeah. won't say anything. Here, so. I, I know I'm, quote unquote, one of the experts, so I know I have things to add. So because of that, I'd find places where she's quiet and sne yeah. sneak in yeah. there. Yeah. So we so appreciate your time and attention. And for those of you who are watching, uh, thank at you home. very much. We thank you for, for being with us. If you have questions, you can reach out to us. Our website is barnsteammedia.com. Be happy to answer your questions and see if there's a way we can be of service in the future. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much to Kim and Mike. And again, let's give them a warm hand. Thank you so much.